species because of, its, of their very wide distribution. So this is their native range. And besides the native range, they can f be found in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, Africa, North America, and even South Af uh, America. So essentially, they invaded almost all the continents that can be invaded. Oh, I think they are in even in Greenland, and I don't know how that's possible, but uh, yes. Uh, so they are very bad, uh, essentially. And when I talk about knotweeds, it's essentially a species complex of three species. So there is Japanese knotweed and giant knotweed, two separate species. And Bohemian knotweed is the hybrid between Japanese and giant knotweed. And again, these are just some pictures of them. So when we look at their distribution, they are almost everywhere in the US. When we look at the finer distribution, you can see that Michigan is very heavily impacted. This is Japanese knotweed distribution. And again, the eastern United States is uh, very heavily impacted. And that's where, again, like they are at uh, the forefront of biological control. And actually, the biocontrol program right now, the, where I'm expecting to get psyllids is from the west coast in Oregon. Uh, that's where they are rearing them. That's where they have the facility. Giant knotweed is not as uh, like uh, widely distributed as Japanese knotweed. And then Bohemian knotweed seems to be almost absent from Michigan based on this map. But they have quite a bit of it in Washington and Idaho. And this is just a missing website. You're all familiar with it. Again, it just confirms those previous maps, uh, like what they've shown, that there is a, we have a lot more of Japanese knotweed than either Bohemian or giant knotweed. But I got contacted by people from the Upper Peninsula and Northern Michigan uh, claiming they have really big giant knotweed infestations they would like controlled. So, so just Japanese knotweed across the seasons. In the spring, you will see the new stems coming up right where the old dead stems are. And again, here is just an old dead stem. That's what you would find right now if you go out there. It's a very hollow bamboo-like stem. As I said, you are all familiar with it. In the summer, you will find these huge bushes with flowers later in the summer and early fall. And then that's again what it looks like in the autumn. And you only see the stalks like left over in the winter. So it can live for decades. It's a perennial plant. And it can grow to 3 to 10 feet tall. Again, you probably know that the leaves are alternate, leathery and oval. It flowers in August and September. And it can reproduce by seeds. But in Michigan, it's more likely that it will reproduce vegetatively by cuttings and rhizomes. And uh, so these underground stems can extend 65 feet. And this is what I'm talking about. That's an underground stem, which I cut with a shovel. But if I wanted to follow it, it could go up to 65 feet. So maybe when you're like controlling uh, plants, it's like could be the same plant essentially just across a really wide area because of the vegetative reproduction. So again, this is another picture of the uh, rhizomes and then new stems sprouting up from the rhizomes. Again, this hollow bamboo-like stem that I showed you. And uh, these are the flowers and then the fruits. And the problem with it is that from every node that you see, it can re-sprout. So that, uh, that's a problem when you're trying to cut it. And when I talk about control, we will t uh, I will show you some pictures. But uh, what they found is a two-inch piece enough to re-sprout if, if you have a node uh, in between. And here comes the, some of the identification things that you were talking about, that there could be misidentification because these, like, they are sometimes hard to tell apart. But leaves are one way to tell them apart. So this is the Japanese knotweed that has a squared off base. It's not as visible here. I will show pictures later that this projector is a little darker than my screen. But so for Japanese knotweed, you have the squared base. And the, this will be a very pointy tip. But for a giant knotweed, you have more of a heart-shaped base here. And the tip is more of a tapering one than a pointy one. Also, if you touch the leaves, the Japanese knotweed will have no hair. It will be very smooth. And the giant knotweed has this tiny hair you can see. Again, if you look at the stems, the Japanese knotweed will start out with reddish stems when they are young. But the giant uh, knotweed will always have green stems. And then when you look at the flowers, again, 
what the what you have to look at here is the ratio of like the the size of the flower versus the subtending leaf so the leaf that's like under so for a uh, Giant knotweed, the flowers are like shorter than the leaves. And then for Japanese knotweed, it's almost the same size, the flowers, as the leaf underneath. And then Bohemian is somewhere in between, since they are the hybrids. And here it's a better picture of Japanese knotweed. You see that uh, like leaf, it's not heart shaped at all. So that's what you would be looking for. And again, this is a giant knotweed leaf that's more heart shaped and much larger. And again, just more pictures of the flowers. And as I said, it's uh, the ratio of the flower to the subtending leaf seems to be important for identification. And this is just a, I just tried to summarize all this information essentially in a, a table. Again, just to look at the leaf shape and that should be a very good uh, like indicator. If you have a squared off base and a pointed tip, it's most likely to be Japanese and then when you have a heart shape that uh, tapers with the tip, then it's more likely to be giant. And for Bohemian, you know, when you look, look around the branch, so what you might see is that lower on the stem, you will have more heart shaped ones. And then as you go like towards the end of the stem, you can have more of the spear shaped ones. So that can be very confusing to people, I guess, like depending on which leaf you're looking at, it looks either uh, Japanese or giant knotweed. But that could be also an indicator that if you have leaves of both types, then maybe it's a hybrid. But again, molecular methods are really good at telling them apart. But I don't know, like, you know, if you want to go that far. Yeah, we started doing just a little bit of that. But yeah, I think. Uh, Yes, it will be important to know what species you have. So that's another reason I'm telling you all these. And again, I will get to that, that the biocontrol agent have preferences between the species. So if you want to release the right biocontrol agent for your infestation, you have to know what the infestation is. And again, so look at the leaf underside. If it's hairless, it's Japanese. If it has long wavy hairs, then it's a giant. And then the Bohemian will have just small bumps or little triangular hairs, essentially. And then the plant height, I think it's very relative. It's hard to say when you're there what it is, but obviously the giant will be larger. And that could be another good indicator that uh, or, uh, initially the Japanese knotweed stems will be reddish that can turn into green, but they will always like retain some of the reddish uh, little lines in them. And then uh, giant knotweed is always green stem. And yeah, and as I said, the flower, the size of the flower to the uh, subtending leaf can be important too. So it can be like Japanese, like knotweeds like moist habitats. They most often found in riparian habitats along waterways. And uh, they also like disturbed habitats like uh, spoil heaps alongside roads, railways. In urban areas, they still use them as landscaping uh, plants. So I will show you pictures from here in Michigan when they are used for landscaping. And, uh, it's <laughs> and then you're landscaping for your neighbor too. They just don't know it yet, right? <laughs> Anyways, uh, it can spread easily along transport corridors, like mowing, snow plowing can spread it, like the sm snow plow, like they can like like catch roots, you know, and move them further along the road and the next spring they will just grow there. Um, and in the UK, they found that they got lots of their infestations from contaminated soil they were using for development. And that's bad news when you're building a house. And so these are just some of the pictures, mostly from the UK, where like they released the biocontrol agent the first time because it's been such a huge problem there that if you use it in, yeah, like if it's on your property, it can grow through your foundation. Like, in, like this, again, this just grows on the roof. This grows through pavement. Uh, again, here, just the smallest cracks and it will grow through. So it's a real, like in the UK, I heard you don't get a mortgage on your house if there is not weed on your property. And uh, again, you see like it can go from the baseboard up through walls. This is a picture taken here in Michigan. This uh, like infestation is like moving on to the garage here. It looked like an abandoned house. So I, I don't know if they care about it. This is in Michigan again, used for landscaping. So again, like I didn't want to go take samples because it was uh, like a private property. 
This is an abandoned uh, lot. Again, this is a huge Japanese knotweed infestation again here in Michigan. And this is not from Michigan, but that's just to demonstrate how it grows along waterways. And you see these root uh, fragments with the flood, they get picked up and they moved downriver. So it's very easy to spread it along water waterways. Again, that's a picture from British Columbia. They use the cut stems to make essentially like a pathway. It's uh, again, you see uh, the erosion here. They were introduced for erosion control, but they are actually not good for erosion control because their root system is uh, not like uh, not robust enough, and it's like, uh, again, this is not enough to hold on to the soil. So they were a poor choice for erosion control. Again, just more pictures how it spreads along waterways. A high, like a high water can pick up those fragments and move them down river. They are in lots of places just along the roads, again, and when you try to mow it or cut it, uh, you know, when they mow it, the, the vegetation along the road, you're just essentially spreading it further down. So it's obviously, you all know, it's very difficult to control because of these rhizomes uh, and the underground root system. And uh, depending on the size of your infestation, there are uh, different methods that are like proposed to do it. Uh, they tried cultural control grazing with uh, ca uh, cattle and goats, and it can reduce biomass, but it will never kill the plant. So you have to just keep grazing it forever, essentially. There are some physical and mechanical control methods. If you have a small infestation and small plants, you may try to pull them, but you have to make sure that you get the whole root system out because they can re-sprout from the smallest rhizome left over. Uh, again, burning not recommended for uh, because the rhizomes will survive, so you don't do much with it. And then mowing, cutting, if you do that, you have to actually collect the, uh, the vegetation that you cut, because if you leave it there, they will re-sprout from those cut pieces. And again, if it needs to be repeated at least twice a month during a growing season, and it can reduce your rhizome reserves, but it rarely kills plants if you just mow. And then for very small infestations, you can just use like a, essentially a weed cloth or like something that blocks sunlight uh, for several seasons and then uh, you can kill them that way. Obviously, chemical treatments have been the most effective and most widely used. Uh, Again, I am not a chemical, like, uh, like uh, I'm not an expert how to use chemicals. I'm a biological control person. So uh, what I'm presenting here comes from peer reviewed uh, papers that I read. And you may think otherwise. I mean, so there are some, so the problem with chemicals is that, so this likes riparian areas and there are very few chemicals that can be used along waterways. Uh, glyphosate is one of them, 2,4-D is another that can be used. For young plants, these are the chemicals that are recommended uh, that could work. And then for actively growing plants later in the season, Again, this glyphosate, picloram, and 2,4-D uh, seems to be working. You can do foliar sprays, especially early in the season. Later in the season, that can be challenging when the plants are three meters tall. And then you can do these stem injections, and uh, they seem to work well. The only problem with that is that uh, by the time you inject a thousand stem, you can easily exceed the statutory maximum per hectare that you could use of that chemical. So that's something to be aware of when you're using stem injections. And again, just a summary of what they find when you, they look at many studies is that the early summer applications can reduce growth, growth, but late summer can be more effective because it disrupts the movement of nutrients that could be allocated to the rhizomes. So the late summer applications could be more effective of preventing them to come back next year, essentially. And uh, what's like most recommended is uh, combining uh, the cutting with uh, spraying. So an IPM approach essentially. And uh, what many people are doing is that they first mow them, maybe down to two inches, and then they spray them with about 25% solution of glyphosate or tricopyr. And again, you can have, yeah, so these applications can also vary, like when you can mow, how often you want to mow, how often you want to spray. So again, like it's up to you and your resources, how many times you want to repeat these applications. 
And I just wanted to show you a few, uh, like, it's just actual data when they try to compare all the different chemicals in a scientific way, you know, like with experiments. So this is a study from 2012. And what they did is they, like, tested different concentrations of, like, four or five different chemicals. You see, like, uh, fluoroxapir here, injected or sprayed. And then this one combined with another chemical injected, or the same combination but with spray. Just to summarize all the studies, the, most, uh, the best method was glyphosate injected. That could reduce uh, the volume and the stem uh, density and everything in the, in the first year after application. And the next year, they started coming back. So it's not like, a, like you have to keep repeating these. And again, when they tested where to inject, uh, there was no difference if you injected low or high. It was the same effect. And then, so again, just the, the, so the, there was a meta-analysis that looked at all the papers about chemical control. And there was not single, one single method that would work everywhere the same way. So it was very site-specific. Uh, and uh, so it's like, there is not one method I can point you towards that will surely work in your infestations. And again, this is just how you control it here in Michigan, which I'm not going to talk about right now. So when you go back to the native range of knotweeds in Japan and Korea, you find very unfit plants that are infested by lots of things and fed upon by many different insects. And what they found when they were looking for biocontrol agents is that in the native range, at least 186 arthropod species and 40 species of fungus were attacking knotweeds. So the premise of biological control is that uh, lots of the invasive species can become invasive because they are free from their natural enemies. When they are released, the new, like the species here don't know how to attack them. They are not adapted to attack them. Maybe a few generalist species will feed on them, but they cannot cause as much damage as specialist feeders. And so when they went back and trying to find again a very specific insect that won't feed on anything else when they release it in the US, they found this psyllid. And psyllids uh, can we also call jumping plant lice. Uh, they are in the same like uh, order as like aphids, you know, those plant sucking insects. Uh, so that's how they damage the plant. They are really small. This is the size of a sesame seed. And they will feed on the sap of the plants, and uh, their feed will cause twisting and curling of leaves and weakens the plants. A single female can lay 700 eggs. And then in five to six weeks, they can develop from egg to adult. So again, this could be like producing at least two generations a year. And these are just pictures of the eggs laid on uh, knotweed stems. And uh, these are the psyllid nymphs. So these are nymphal stages. So it's an incomplete development. They don't have a pupil stage, just the uh, egg nymphs and adults. And that's the adult there. And these are the damage they cause to giant knotweed potted plants when they were reared on. So this twisting and curling of the leaves. Uh, and they found some small plants were killed by the feeding. But again, that's just in the lab potted plants when you can increase the density of the psyllids. So we don't know what it does in nature. What's interesting is that these psyllids were collected in two different locations in Japan, uh, the northern island in Hokkaido and also the southern island in Kyushu. So they call them the Hokkaido and the Kyushu race. And what they found is that the the Hokkaido race have a better impact on giant knotweed, and they prefer giant knotweed. They have better reproduction on giant knotweed, and uh, it would be a better match to northern climates, which is good news for Michigan because we have giant knotweed actually up in the north. And then the Kyushu race performs better on Japanese knotweed. They lay more eggs, and they, more, they do more damage on Japanese knotweed. And again, that could be a better climate match to more of the southern infestations. So that's why it's important because right now in Oregon, they have both of these host races and they're going to send us what we ask for. If we only ask for the Kyushu race, you know, that will be good against Japanese knotweed. But uh, again, we could ask for both of them. And that's when it comes like we need to know what we are targeting. So the status of this biocontrol agent was uh, first released in the UK in 2010, 2013. That wasn't successful. Uh, they think it's because they were in culture for hundreds of generations. They were doing all the whole specificity testing, so they became inbred. 
So they acquired the new colony from, the, from Japan and that established, but that was in 2016. So again, just three years ago, so we don't know uh, what, how, what they are doing. It's been only three years. Uh, they are slow to establish. In Canada, they started field releases in 2014. And they could confirm overwintering success, but they don't see the huge populations that would cause damage just yet. Again, it's very early to say uh, what's got, like, uh, how long it takes for them to build up large populations. And the US permit is in the last stage. Uh, I was at a meeting two weeks ago, and the regulator said there that they expect it to be decided on this year. Again, I hope that happens. Uh, so once the APHIS makes the decision on the federal level that they approve, then Michigan has another month to approve themselves, and then we can get the agent here to Michigan. And I have a grant pending for the Michigan Invasive Species Program that I just don't know if the approval process goes through by the time they decide on the grant. But so as I said, I have right now hundred roots dug up and I'm ready to grow the plants. If everything is approved, I could have colonies in the lab hopefully next year. And then we go from there. <laughs>